Let's continue with the question under historical objections as, as to whether the New Testament itself can be called anti-Semitic. We've seen how it contains the same prophetic rebuke of, of Jewish hypocrisy or Jewish sin as, as we find in the Hebrew Scriptures. We found that it reiterates the promises and the covenantal blessing coming to the Jewish people as the Hebrew Scriptures did as well. And we've seen that when, when the New Testament speaks of Jewish culpability in the death of Yeshua, it doesn't blame the nation as a whole. Oh, they can be addressed. Peter will address them and, and saying, you crucified the Messiah, as he speaks to the, to the nation, say, because there was Jewish culpability among the leaders in giving him over, and he's saying, repent. But even then, it's like, God wants to have mercy on you. It, it, it's not a word of condemnation. It's saying, you did the wrong thing, repent. And he even says, you did it in ignorance. Peter says that in Acts, the third chapter. I know you did it in ignorance. So repent because God wants to bless you. And he sent Messiah first to you, to, to our people, so he could bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So the, the fact that these statements are found in the New Testament in terms of Jewish culpability in terms of the death of Jesus, the Gospels make clear that it was not the people as a whole. In fact, it singles out the religious leadership, and even within that, the role of the high priest or priest, and someone argued that the high priest was just a Roman crony, yeah, Jewish, but a Roman crony under the thumb of Rome. So it's not indicting the people as a whole, and when it speaks to the nation as a whole, like the prophets always would, they'd speak to the nation as a whole and call for repentance. It's all with, with mercy, all with the promise of restoration and blessing. Uh, let me take this further. When Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, was about to come out, there were some Jewish organizations in America that were up in arms saying, oh no, oh no, it's anti-Semitic, it's terrible, it's really bad, and there's, there's going to be riots against the synagogues, and Jewish people's lives can be in danger. Now, and I hadn't seen uh, enough in terms of previews or whatever to know whether it would be anti-Semitic or not. And, and I watched it. I, I didn't find it anti-Semitic personally. Some of my friends did. To be honest, when I saw the religious leaders, they struck me as medieval church leaders, the, the garments. I mean, that's, that's what I saw more than anything, just corrupt leadership. And it was clear enough that Yeshua and his disciples were, were Jews as well in the film. But either way, let's just say it was anti-Semitic. And, and Mel Gibson's subsequent anti-Semitic rant when he was arrested for drunk driving, yeah, he, he could well be anti-Semitic, God knows. My friend Rabbi Shmuley was convinced before the movie he was anti-Semitic, and then after that rant he said, you see, I was right. But let's just say it was anti-Semitic. And let's just say it could have provoked a uh, uh, violent outcry from Christians against the Jews. Why didn't it happen? Because Christians don't do those things. I've been following Jesus for 41 years. I've been in church circles for 41 years and in Messianic congregations. I've preached around the world. I've, I've been overseas scores and scores and scores of times. I've, I've been to, to Italy, as of this recording, 21 times, in India, 20 times, in Korea, a dozen times, in Germany and England, well over 20, 30 times between that. I've never once met a Christian who blamed the Jews that killed Jesus. No, we thank God for the death of Jesus. This is looked at as a positive thing. Jesus died for me. No one's out to get the Christ killers. This was an aberration when this happened in history. This was an aberration in, in Eastern Europe after a, a, a service maybe in Poland or in, in Russia in the 1800s after an Easter service that, that the, the so-called Christians would go out to look for a Jew to kill or to beat because they killed Christ. This is complete aberration. We celebrate the Messiah's death. We say he died for our sins. One of our favorite verses is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We celebrate that. Yeshua said, no one takes his, my life from me. I lay it down freely. And where there is culpability, it's our sins nailed them to the cross. We were guilty. He died in our place, but he did it willfully and joyfully to die for us. We don't think, well, find, find those Romans, go to Italy and find those Romans because they were killed, those soldiers, nailed them to the cross. No, no Christian with the right mind thinks like that. So the fact that there is some Jewish culpability in giving Messiah over to the Romans to kill him does not damn all the Jewish people for all time. And, and listen, listen, the Talmud and Moses Maimonides 
speak freely of Jewish participation in Yeshua's death. Does that make them anti-Semitic? Maimonides says this, Jesus of Nazareth, who aspired to be the Messiah, was executed by the court. This is what he speaks of. He speaks of Jesus of Nazareth, who aspired to be the Messiah, was executed by the court. Rabbi uh, Eliyahu Tauger, a respected commentary or commentator of Maimonides, said this, the Jews did not actually carry out the crucifixion or carry out the execution, for crucifixion is not one of the Torah's methods of execution. Rather, after condemning him to death, the Sanhedrin handed him over to the Roman authorities who executed him as a rebel against Roman rule. This is Maimonides who said this. Listen to what the Talmud says. This is uh, Sanhedrin 43a and, and other places. On the eve of Passover, they hanged Jesus the Nazarene. And a herald went out before him for 40 days saying he's going to be stoned because he practiced sorcery and led Israel astray. Anyone who knows anything in his favor, let him come and plead in his behalf. But not having found anything in his favor, they hanged him on the eve of Passover. This is saying that Jews were responsible for his death in the Talmud. So if the Talmud says it, Moses Maimonides says it, then why is the New Testament anti-Semitic for recording what happened? It is a misuse of the texts that is anti-Semitic. It is a misuse of the texts that led to brutality against our people. But can I tell you some of the main texts that, that Muslims use to attack Jews? It's the Talmud. They use the Talmud to attack Jews. And they'll often use what the Old Testament says about the Jews to attack Jews and to say they are corrupt people. How about this? The Jews are consistently demonized in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John. Jews, 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 Jews. Actually, many translators recognize that the Greek word Jews can mean Jews as a whole, or it can mean the leaders of the Jewish people, or it can mean Judeans. Now, now what's interesting, you have texts, for example, in Jeremiah or Nehemiah, take, take Nehemiah 2.16, where Jews means Judeans, people living in Judah after the exile return from Babylonian exile, as opposed to the exile. So Nehemiah, who is a Jew, it, it, he refers to another group called the Jews, along with the priests, nobles, officials, or any others who would be doing the work. They were all Jews, but he refers to the Jews as a separate group. Similarly, when John speaks of the Jews in the New Covenant, he's generally referring either to the Jewish inhabitants of J Judea in general, or to Jewish religious leaders. So uh, some new translations like David Stern's Jewish New Testament or the Tree of Life version uh, correct this in many ways. John 7, 1, most of our English translations say, after this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. Well, aren't there Jews in Galilee? Well, the Jews there where Judea were waiting to take his life. David Stern renders this, after this, Yeshua traveled around in the Galil, Galilee, intentionally avoiding Yehuda, Judea, because the Judeans were out to kill him. So he avoided Judea because the Judeans were out to kill him. John 9, 22, the Jewish parents of a Jewish blind man who had been miraculously healed were afraid of, quote, the Jews who controlled the synagogues, obviously meaning the Jewish religious authorities. So when we rightly understand that Jews can sometimes mean Judeans or Jewish religious leaders in the Greek text, and we translate properly, we see that the Jews as a whole are not consistently demonized. I understand how that reading could come in our English Bibles or someone not as nuanced in reading the Greek text, but that would be an exaggerated and untrue statement. I could just as well say Israel is demonized in, in the Old Testament, and just pull out certain verses where sometimes it's the leadership and sometimes people living in a particular place and sometimes the nation as a whole. But then there are many wonderful positive promises and statements. Some of those positive promises are reiterated in the New Testament. Let's also remember that these were in-house disputes. In-house disputes. Now, that's not an excuse for lack of civility but it does explain that the rhetoric can be heightened when it's in-house. Uh, scholars have pointed out, if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and look how the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls often spoke about their theological opponents, 
Jews versus Jews, or how Josephus spoke against other Jewish groups, as night and day compared to the New Testament. I, I'm talking about vicious attacks and, and, and really harsh words, and not just against some of the leaders and religious hypocrites like Yeshua singles out in, in Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Some of the attacks are, are much, much more broad than that. Some scholars have pointed out if you, if you discovered the, the New Testament now just as ancient, an ancient Jewish document, some of the accounts of the Gospels or things like that, ancient Jewish documents, and, and you found them with Dead Sea Scrolls, you saw these attacks, Jew against Jew, you wouldn't say it's anti-Semitic, you just say this is an in-house family dispute. And other Jewish scholars have verified, no, there, there is no anti-Semitism in the New Testament. There's a rejection of Jewish hypocrisy. There's an uh, indicting of certain Jewish leaders. There's a call for Jewish people to turn to Messiah and receive mercy. But there is not Jew hatred in the New Testament. How about this objection? The Jewish religious leaders, especially the Pharisees, are depicted as snakes and vipers, hypocrites who are rotten to the core and men worthy of damnation. Well, again, that's part of the intra-Jewish religious polemic like you find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like you find in the, the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus, all within the same time frame as the New Testament, a little bit before, same time, a little bit after. But the New Testament does not only have a negative picture about these religious leaders. There are some positive pictures. Yeshua dines at the home of a Pharisee. Uh, there are Pharisees who warn Yeshua. So he dines at the home of Pharisee in Luke 7. There, there are Pharisees who warn Yeshua that Herod wants to kill him in Luke the 13th chapter. Paul identifies as a Pharisee in the book of Acts. I'm, I'm a Pharisee. There's a, a gracious picture painted of Gamaliel, a Pharisaical leader, painted as, as, as a man of wisdom with gracious counsel, uh, trying to spare the apostles from, from death in Acts the 5th chapter. So there is not universal bashing. And again, the fact that there is an indictment about hypocrisy, well, you've got that throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. You, you, you've got that throughout our Bible. There is even a Talmudic polemic about Pharisaical hypocrisy. So again, we have to out and out reject that. What about what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2? When he told his Gentile readers, Thessalonian followers of Jesus, Thessalonian Christians, he told his Gentile readers that the Jews displease God, are hostile to all men, killed both the prophets and the Messiah, and are objects of God's wrath to the uttermost. That is outright blatant anti-Semitic, is it not? No, not, not if read correctly. Here's what happens. When Paul's preaching in Thessalonica, and he would go to the synagogues first as a Jew. He'd go to the synagogue and declare the good news of Yeshua the Messiah, and they'd discuss it and debate it. Well, some of the Jews believed, some Gentiles who were in the synagogue, God-fearing Gentiles, they believed. But there are other Jews who stirred up trouble, and, and you end up with a riot in the city. And, 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 and some of these troublemaking Jews then followed him to some other cities and stirred up trouble for him. Rabble, rousers. Every group has them. Every group has extremists. Every group has those who make, make the rest of the group look very bad. Not only so, the, the followers of Jesus, the Gentile followers of Jesus in Thessalonica suffered a lot for their faith. They suffered heavy and serious persecution. And Paul writes about it in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. You've suffered persecution. We are also suffering persecution. He says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Therefore, among God's churches, among God's congregations, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Now, he wants to encourage them. You're not alone in this. We've, we've suffered the same thing from our own people. What you've suffered in Thessalonica, we've suffered in Judea from our own people. You've suffered it from your fellow Thessalonians. We've suffered it from our fellow Jews. And he says this, For you brothers became imitators of God's congregations in Judea, which are in Messiah Jesus. 
You suffered from your own countrymen. The same things those congregations suffered from the Jews, or remember, could mean Judeans, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Paul was not saying that all Jews were guilty of killing Yeshua any more than he was saying that all Jews were guilty of killing the prophets or that all Jews were guilty of driving him out of city after city. Listen to what he says again. For you brothers became imitators of God's congregations in Judea. In other words, the way they were suffering for the faith, you've also suffered for the faith. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those congregations suffered from the Jews or the Judeans who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God. They're hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to limit the wrath of God. It's come upon them at last. What, what, what's he saying? Those same unbelieving Jews who in previous generations killed the prophets and then the Messiah are now making life difficult for us Jews who do believe in Yeshua. They displease God and they're hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. It's not an indictment on all Jews. <laughs> Paul speaks of the broken heart he has for his Jewish people in Romans 9. Same Paul. Paul warns the Gentiles in Rome not to be arrogant towards the Jewish people. The same Paul says, even though they may be enemies because of the gospel, opposing the faith, they're, they're loved because of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God's gifts and calling are irrevocable, Romans 11, 28, and 29. And there'll be a national turning and all Israel will be saved. Well, if the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, it means they're utterly damned, then how can he say there's going to be a national turning and they'll be saved and God's going to keep his promises? He's either speaking of the Judeans in particular, that, that it, was, it was Jews in Jerusalem who persecuted the prophets like Isaiah. Remember, it's according to Jewish tradition that Jerusalem Jews killed Isaiah, put him to death. He's either saying that, these Judean Jews, these Jews of Jerusalem, they've killed the prophets, they killed the Messiah, who was it after all? High priest and his cronies and some of the other religious leadership based in Jerusalem and Judea, they killed him. They gave him over to the Romans to be killed. They're culpable in his death. And they're persecuting us now too. Judgments come upon them. Judgment of God's come upon them. So he's either speaking of non-believing Jews who've been hostile to God, hostile to the prophets, hostile to the Messiah, now hostile to the apostles, to the emissaries, them, or specifically those Jerusalemite or Judean Jews who've been carrying out these crimes against the prophets, against the Messiah. Uh, uh, same bad breed, same bad blood, now persecuting the Messiah's followers. And you're suffering the same thing from your countrymen as you are from us. That's what he's saying, and it was historically true. It's not anti-Semitic, nor is it bringing a curse on all Jews for all generations. Well, lastly, the New Testament charges the Jews with deicide, killing God. No wonder Christians turned on them so violently. Let me repeat that the death of Messiah is celebrated in the New Testament. That he says in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. New Testament teaches, number one, that God, our father, sent his son into the world to die for us. That was his mission. That was God's love. Number two, Yeshua says, I lay down my life willingly, my own accord. Number three, the New Testament teaches that Messiah died for our sins. Isaiah 53 says that all of us sinned and went astray and our sins were put on his shoulders. His death brings us life. Number four, Jewish leadership rejected him. Number five, Romans crucified him. And what's our response to be? Thank God for the blood of Messiah. Thank God for his death. Thank God for his sacrifice. All the more should we love him. That's the only response I've seen from followers of Jesus for over 40 years around the world. I've never once met a true follower of Jesus. Uh, never, ever, ever. Uh, someone that 
their brain. I, I ran into one crazy anti-Semite in, in, in Washington, D.C. one time who was a total weirdo, claimed to be a Christian, was a total weirdo. I'm talking about God knows how many thousands of Christians I've met around the world. I've never once heard any of them blame the Jews. You don't blame anyone for the Messiah's death. You thank God for the Messiah's death, and you thank the Messiah for his death. So the idea that the New Testament charges the Jews with deicide, not just Christ killers, but God killers, because Christ is God, is preposterous. Nor is there ever a text that says, you killed God. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say, well, the Messiah is God and you kill the Messiah, therefore you kill God. That's not spoken in the New Testament. What is spoken is Peter rebuking his fellow Jews within just weeks of the Messiah's death, saying, you crucified him. God wants to have mercy on you. That's what it does say. But, but listen to this. Acts 3, verses 17 to 20. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. You dirty Christ killers. You killed our God. We're going to kill you. No! This is what Peter the Jew preaches. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He doesn't damn them for killing God. He doesn't damn them for killing the Messiah. He says, I know you acted in ignorance, so repent so that God can bless you. Listen to this. Paul addressing this. Acts 13. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Yeshua, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Verse 38. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Yeshua, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. He doesn't say, you damnable, rotten, I'm ashamed to even be a Jew today. You Christ killers, God killers, assassins of Christ, guilty of deicide. He says, no, you didn't recognize him. So I'm proclaiming to you forgiveness of sins through his death. Well, one more alleged anti-Semitic piece in the New Testament. The real problem with the New Testament is the notion that God is finished with the Jewish people, that they are now the synagogue of Satan, having been replaced by Christians who are the true Jews in the new Israel. That's a false interpretation of the texts. When Paul is writing to the Roman believers in Romans, the 11th chapter, to Gentiles in Rome, you know what he says to them? He says, I'm writing to you Gentiles. He doesn't call them Jews. He said, I'm writing to you Gentiles with the hope that you can provoke my people Israel to envy. In other words, that you can live such godly lives, that you can be so full of the Spirit, that you can know God so wonderfully well, that you can demonstrate to the world what it means to be forgiven by the Messiah, that you can have something so special that Jewish people will look at you and say, I want what you have. He doesn't call them Israel. He doesn't call them spiritual Jews. And he said, you make a terrible mistake if you think that God has permanently cut them off. No, even now there's a remnant, there's always a remnant of Jews who believe in the Messiah, in Yeshua, and they'll be turning back at the end. And God's going to keep all of his promises to them. And he's not going to go back on his word. It is a gross misinterpretation of the New Testament that says the church has replaced Israel. No, instead, this is what Paul teaches, that many of the spiritual promises that came to Israel now come to Gentile believers as well. They can read the Psalms and say, yes, God loves me. And, and the Lord is my shepherd. They can read the promises to Israel where he said, I'll bless you and I'll keep you and say, he's going to bless me and keep me as well. They can share in the spiritual promises, but 10 commandments say, lo tignov, do not steal. The church sinned when it stole the promises from Israel and said, these are ours alone. And Paul warned about that. Paul warned about it, didn't he? Romans, the 11th chapter, and said, if, if you have a wrong notion of, the, of the, the Jewish roots of the faith and if you have a wrong notion towards your Jewish friends and neighbors who don't believe in Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, and you think you've replaced them and God's finished with them, you too will be cut off. And that's how the church became, at times in history, so corrupt in some of its forms and so powerless in some of its forms spiritually because it cut itself off from its Jewish roots. The Jewish New Testament, the New Testament itself, anti-Semitic, God forbid. It's a wonderfully Jewish book. We'll finish up historical objections in the next class. Our offers on this program, the best of Dr. Brown's Jewish debates. 
Join Dr. Michael Brown in three of his best debates and travel along on the journey of discovery as truth is laid out in these powerful DVDs. Watch as Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Brown, Orthodox Rabbi Shmuley Botea, and Rabbi Michael Gold argue for two very different interpretations of Scripture in these fast-moving debates. These presentations will provide you with information that will help you answer the questions, Is Jesus the promised Messiah or not? Is Jesus kosher? And did Jesus really die for our sins? For your tax-deductible gift of $40 or more, Michael would like to send you these three DVD presentations. Did Jesus die for our sins? Jesus, Messiah or not? And kosher Jesus? Build your faith and learn how to effectively witness to the Jewish people as you learn about the hard questions surrounding the identity of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and much more. These presentations will be a treasure to you and your family for years to come. Also, please visit our website or call and ask how you can receive access to our countless free resources. Learn exciting information on what is happening around the world and with our ministry today. When you visit our website, be sure to check out our bookstore for the latest videos, books, and more. You you may want to join us during an upcoming radio broadcast. Please contact us today for more information. Please remember, this ministry depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. Thank you so much for watching the broadcast. and I, I trust you enjoyed this week's episode as, as we tackle some of the tough Jewish historical objections to Jesus being the Messiah. And I trust as you're watching, your own faith is being built and, and questions you've had, you're getting answers to and you're finding out a lot about history you didn't know before. And maybe this is helping to equip you to better share your faith in Jesus with your Jewish friends and coworkers. And maybe you're watching this broadcast and you're Jewish, you, you just tune in and say, well, I don't believe in Jesus, but, but you got me thinking, ah, I want to keep you thinking. Isaiah the prophet, the Lord said through him, come now, let us reason together. So tune in next week. We're going to keep looking at historical objections. Tune in next week and then visit my website, askdrbrown.org. Contact us with your questions and comments and be sure to tune in next week as we continue to answer your toughest questions. program made possible by financial contributions to Ask Dr. Brown Ministries from viewers like you in your area. Thank you for your support.